good girl! <laughs> If a failure occurs, such as um, just a, a refusal to respond, a failure to respond, or multiple commands required, or you know, failing to come in actually to within close proximity to me, then it's not like a, I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm looking to see, as I say, where she's at. And you know, if that happens, then I know that we need to do some more work on that aspect of it. Um, so just have a look, you know, come along with me, have a look, me taking a walk. Um, I'll go and get them out and we'll see. We'll see what's what. They've already had a little bit of a spin around, but um, we'll take them on down through and um, for a few minutes, come along and watch. Okay, so we're out in the uh, in the woodland. I don't know what time it is. Four o'clock, half four, something like that. And I'm testing response reliability to the recall whistle in the black one. Okay, I shan't give a name, but the black one. And what I'm looking for is immediacy and enthusiasm in the response. And I'm going to see, maybe I might put in about, I guess about five, maybe six recalls as we walk along. And let's see what we get. So it's a lovely live environment, isn't it? Exactly as it should be for a dog. You know, no double clip leads, no front clip harnesses, no head harness. Oh, look, lovely. Fox. No head harnesses, no figure eights. Not that there's anything wrong with any of them. But where it comes to the point that those are the only means by which people can exercise dogs other than secure paddocks, then when you look at this as a life, it doesn't take a genius to figure out which is the more welfare friendly for the dog. So again, this is really to test myself as well as her and the level of my training and my trust in it. Might be a bit of a boring video to watch. It shouldn't be because we're in a stunning location, but we'll see. So first one. Come on, good girl, come on. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Make it here, come on. Good girl, wait. Well done, Angel. Well done, Angel. Leave her alone. Turd, <laughs> she's a turd. So that's the first one. Successful, not as fast as I'd like, but then the terrain isn't brilliant, is it? And as I say, to break her off the, the scents and things that are around here. I'm okay with that, I'm good with that. Let's see how we go with the others. So I'm not looking to show off, I'm not looking to push massive distances or anything like that. I'm just looking for nice responding, nice sharp responding. She doesn't have to adopt a perfect position when she comes back or anything, she just needs to come back. As you can see as well, I've got no means of compelling the recall, I've got no means of luring it. The reward is social. The reward is interaction with myself because that's how I want it to be. I want the behavior to be self-rewarding, if you like. Yay, good girl. Come on, come on, and you. Come on, Maggie, good girl. Oh, good girl, sweetheart. I know. But again, as you can see, the level of interaction between me and her when she comes back, really nice social bond building exercise. We're going to get back again from the dogs down there, look. Two spaniels running down there by the water. If you do, there's nothing wrong with using food. There's nothing wrong with using toys or alternative reinforcers slash rewards to be able to, you know, uh, establish your recall and develop your recall. <clears throat> but there's something wrong when you rely on them because the entire purpose of a reinforcer is to build. And if you're not seeing building without it, it isn't working. Good girl. Well done, sweet. Ready? Come here. Good girl. Again, I'm not going to really push it with her. I just want to get a few under, under her belt, under my belt, a few more where, you know, it's testing me as well. I can't rely on what I've got in my pocket or I can't rely on my ability to communicate with her electronically. Well, I can. This is the thing, I can, but I don't want to. I don't want to. I want it to be a tool that goes in, teaches, tightens up, does a job, and I need to be able to see that she responds without it. Isn't this lovely though? I say it again. 
isn't it lovely to see them doing what they do, being what they are, completely free, controlled, responsive, you know, enjoying life. It's terrific, isn't it? I know a lot of people produce some really nice, secure fields for dogs to run in. And they, you know, try and enrich them environmentally as much as they can. But you'll never compete with this. And for me personally, I need to try and be able to provide for that dog, you know, safely. To be able to give her as much as I possibly can in her short lifetime. Keep her safe. Make her responsive. Let her enjoy the life that she's got. Oh, some random piece of crap. It's obviously incredibly important, look. <laughs> piece of cardboard, look. Something like that. Or a piece of wood. Yeah, very valuable. A nice opportunity while she's got a prized possession in a moment. <laughs> look at it. An entire bloody woodland. And that's the most important bit. I'll say, sorry if the video's a little bit uh, mundane to watch. Please don't slide through it because... This is it, you know, people want to watch dog training, you're watching it. This is as mundane as it often is, but with the thrills of the decent responding thrown in there as well. You can see how often I put in commands personally for the dogs. I'm not overdoing it, you know, I'm not on their case all the time. I want it to be sharp. If I keep doing it, if I keep doing it, it'll start to wane. So when you're recall training, don't continually pump in recalls all the time. And in terms of when do you know that it's, oh, she almost took her legs out. In terms of when do you know that it's good to, you know, test the dog without any control equipment. Experience is the answer to that. Experience lets you know when the dog's ready. And unfortunately, you can't really read it and you can't really watch it. You have to work with somebody and, well, you're doing it. You're with me watching it so you can see when and how I put recalls in. Um, but don't go out and try and copy and stick your dog in a situation where you can't control them when they're not ready to be in that situation and expect that they're going to come back because it simply doesn't work like that. And <clears throat> I'm the last person on earth to try and advise anybody to be irresponsible or to put their dog or any other animal at risk. So if you can seek somebody out who knows what they're doing, who can show it, give them a call and work with them, even if it's just for a little bit. <laughs> oh, good girl, good girl, go on. That was all right, wasn't it? Um, so here we are then. Same as yesterday, really. Out and about with her, a few dogs around, give her a bit of distraction. Um, and I'm looking to recall her this time using verbal commands instead of the whistle. Um, as per yesterday, I've got no means of compelling or coercing or anything else a recall, you know. She either does it or she doesn't, and <laughs> I stand or fall on the level of the conditioning that I put into her. Um, but the reason, I, again, that I'm using the a verbal this time is, uh, as I said in an earlier video, once you start to become significant and relevant to the dog, that relevance should extend so that it doesn't really matter what sort of command you're giving for a recall. The dogs generally tend to perk up and respond to it anyway. Hope, oh, sod. I was just going to say, hopefully, I think I've lost the mongrel, but no. Back, like a sodding iron file into a magnet. Anyway, I want her out and away. But I can't force that. <laughs> can't force that either. Isn't this lovely? Hey, isn't this how it should be? Dogs out being dogs. Just absolutely living their best life. Out in the middle of this beautiful countryside in November. This is behavioural expression. This is for freedom of behavioural expression, if you like. You know, I said it yesterday, but I'll say it again. This is what it's all about. Being able to provide for the animal in the most that you can possibly provide for it in the safest way, whilst being responsible and taking into account other people, other animals, social and legal expectations and demands, but still just being able to be out with your dog and be absolutely carefree because you know that you've got control over them. So it doesn't really matter what comes your way. If you can call that dog back and that dog comes straight back on a sixpence without any hesitation, then it's all good. I'm gonna give her a verbal now. Back up! 
got you. <laughs> lovely, 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 lovely. This is what we're looking for. That speed, that enthusiasm. Um, I had a, a Zoom last night with a chap, he won't mind me saying, keep him anonymous, and was talking about electronic collars and recalls with his dog. And I said, for the moment, park the remote collar work on the motivation work on the positive incentive work on getting that enthusiasm in that recall that speed that will go away from you can just as easily come back to you if you get it right and this is it's just beautiful to see isn't it watch i do it again Beep. yay <laughs> whoa <laughs> well done you two it's lovely isn't it it really is lovely and you'll notice the words are different and they can be different but they're said in a you know, an exciting way. I'm not needing to run back away from her anymore. I'm not pumping food into her or anything like that. Nothing wrong with using food to reward a recall. It's just not what I'm choosing to do at the moment. I want it to be a social reward. So there you go. There we are, I think, what's that? Two or three more, just for you to see. I'm gonna trot on with them and do some more as well. And uh, we'll keep pushing. Thank you for watching. Okay, so here we are back again in the woodland. Um, we've got Sherlock Pumpkin and the girl that I'm working with here, all out together. And what we're looking at once again is naked responding. So responding without the use of an electronic collar, um, without any means of basically controlling whether or not the dog responds other than the whistle. And this brings me on to a, um, an area that I'd just like to briefly cover, and that is the whistle. And I got asked, in fact, I've asked several times, but I got asked pretty recently, what whistle do you use? And the whistle that I use, or the person said, the whistle that I use, my dog seems to ignore or learns to ignore, um, but yours, the dog seems to respond really, really nicely to. Look, the whistle is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what tone or pitch or speed that you blow the whistle at, you know, the volume of it, it doesn't matter. What matters is what does the whistle mean to the dog? What experience has the dog had in response to the blowing of that whistle? Okay, so that could be a positive experience or a negative experience. So what I'm saying is it's basically Pavlovian conditioning. So I blow the whistle, feed the dog, blow the whistle, feed the dog, blow the whistle, throw a ball, blow the whistle, praise the dog, relatively closely together. So I'm not waiting, I don't blow the whistle and then wait for the dog to come back when I'm starting off and then feed or praise the dog should the dog happen to come back. That'll get me reliability that's essentially worth nothing what i do is i teach it as a separate exercise in itself the pairing of that whistle with that reward delivery is its own exercise okay so whether you bang saucepans together shout blamange you know whatever whatever happens prior to that reward delivery is what the dog will come to associate with that reward delivery and it will become a positive signal all right so when you get your whistle whatever the whistle is I happen to have a preference, but I'm not going to name them because um, I'm not advertising for anybody. But um, I happen to have a preference. But when you get that whistle, go through the exercise of blowing it, feeding the dog, blowing it, throw a ball, blowing it, fuss the dog, whatever it is that floats your dog's boat. Then go out and start using that, week, uh, that whistle as a recall signal when the dog's at pretty short distance from you. So don't wait until they're belting off around. You basically want to take what you've taught in close proximity and extend it out so that they begin to understand. And when you start working with electronic collars or if you're working with long lines, electronic collar combinations or long lines, you know, themselves, you can also use the whistle to announce the likelihood of the stimulation from the collar or the pressure from the long line as well okay but as long as what it announces is relevant and of value to the dog and experience of value to the dog you'll progress you should progress so somebody else said you know how often are you throwing recalls in i think i might have put this in an earlier clip excuse me if i'm repeating yourself i'm not banging on i'm not boring the dog you'll you'll work against yourself less is more get decent quality you know even if you get two or three really nice responses end it at that you know, don't, don't keep putting them in. It's not a case of repeating, repeating, repeating. People say that dog training is about repetition. No, it isn't. Dog training is about repeating things that matter, things that are, deter or, you know, are leading to progress, you know, things that are of value. It isn't just about repeating in itself. It's, it's about the dog having multiple experiences over an extended period of time that actually have meaning to him or her, okay? 
So don't think that just because you go out and can do recall, you have, well, you're having a look now. Look how many times I've called the dog. Um, so don't think that just because you're training on a recall that you need to keep recalling. It doesn't work like that. Not if you want decent responses. I'll bring her back in from wherever she is now. Oh, she's there. There she goes, look, the flat one. Let's have a look. I have a very bad habit when I'm recording with an iPhone in my hand of pushing the power off button when I'm bending down to interact with the dogs that cuts the video. So sorry about that. Hopefully my son will be able to um, paste the two together because he's better than I am. There's how often you want to be putting recalls in. For those people who are in interested in um, the inclusion of the electronic collar into the recall process, I'm going to put that in as a separate video in itself. Uh, so I've done the introduction. Then I'm going to talk about how you start to build understanding with the dog with the electronic collar and how you're going on to proofing responsing with the electronic collar as well i'll do that as a separate video the other thing that i wanted to talk about um, very briefly is there is a popular misconception particularly amongst people who are against people who are open to the idea of including you know negative consequences for negative behaviors into tra in training dogs Certainly when it comes to predatory behaviour and controlling a dog with high prey drive. And people will say to you that, isn't it beautiful? Sorry, but isn't it beautiful, look? Absolutely gorgeous. People will say to you that um, I, working with this dog, I'm trying to tell you that I can take away the dog's predatory instinct, that I can take its prey drive out of it. Her. No, I can't. Let me just bring her back in. She's way over there. I'm going to use a verbal. Let's have a look. <laughs> okay so to come back to that point when you're working with a dog that has got a rehearsal history of successfully predating towards another animal right which basically means chasing attacking killing going off hunting after other animals and they've done it and they've done it and they've done it and they love it and they live for it you know whether that's because of their breeding their heritage you know the genetics or the actual learning history of the dog whatever it happens to be what you're not doing, let me be the first to say this, or not the first, by no, by no means, that's the wrong word to say, but let me just state this quite categorically. What you are not doing is taking away the dog's prey drive. You aren't taking away the dog's predatory instinct. You can't do that. It's like saying, I'm going to take away the dog's sex drive, or I'm going to take away the dog's appetite. You can't do that. But here's the thing. What you can do is you can control which animals the dog is able to or chooses to itself that's a very important thing chooses to predate towards okay so if you are open and receptive to the inclusion of electronic training collars or other training approaches um, basically taking the needs of the dog in front of you and the owner and the context you know taking the whole thing as like a, a compound of information and doing what is necessary rather than what you would prefer to be necessary, then you are gonna extend your reach in how much you're able to affect the choices of that dog. If you don't do that, so if you follow a particular training methodology, for example, I won't use correction, I will only work with food and toys and praise, then you limit your ability to be able to do that. And that is simply fact, okay? That is simply truth fact anybody who works in you know with dogs with that particular approach really if you put your hand on your heart you ought to equally put your other hand up and say this is true because it is true the other thing is you can control predation if you're open to having you know a, a receptive mindset in terms of what's required to offer the dog the greatest freedoms or the greatest degree of choice you can control the dog by having strong recall, strong heel work, strong stationary positions, etc. So I can choose, I can have the dog think that animal isn't worth chasing, that animal isn't worth my time by using electronic collar, for example, to have the dog think, I don't want to go towards that animal, it's bad news. And equally, I can have the dog think, oh, I can chase that, I can chase that. But when I call, or if I say, no, you're not doing that, you're healing, or no, you remain where you are, sweetheart then that happens. So you can control the predatory instinct of a dog. You don't remove it. 
So where people say, oh, you can't remove the predatory incident. No, you can't. And nobody's saying that you can. But that almost gets thrown up as like an argument or justification for their failure to actually push themselves and the dog to achieve what is achievable. And then will come the argument. It's about ethics. I'm the more ethical trainer because I choose not to use punishment in training. I choose not to give the dog uh, aversive experiences. I choose not to let the dog think that was a bad idea because a bad consequence happened as a result of it. So if you think that that makes you ethical because you're looking principally, in fact solely, at the momentary experiences of the dog, then you don't understand ethics. Not in its whole, not in its entirety. Because when you're working with animals and you're looking at animal welfare, that ethical lens needs to extend way beyond the dog and the moment your experiences of the one dog to all the other animals that that dog will interact with and the people that the dog will interact with. And how does my training approach affect those animals? How do I secure the freedoms of those animals? So if my dog's off lead and we're walking through woodland like this as they are and they decide I'm going to go for that squirrel or I'm going to go for that cat if it's around a housing estate or whatever or a park and the dog goes and your dog fails to recall because chasing that animal is more enjoyable than the rewards that you've got on offer. How ethical is that for the experiences of the other animal at that time? And when that is multiplied by multiple animals, how ethical is that? So you can't just dish out the, I don't use corrective intervention when I'm training dogs as a sort of like, get out of jail free card or a ethical superiority card, because it doesn't work like that. And I would get people to really, again, just think about it. Think about it. If you disagree with me, disagree with me. If you think I'm talking absolute shit, then think well, you're talking absolute shit. That's fine. It's not a problem. As long as you think about it and as long as other people who maybe aren't as opposed to the idea of opening their mind and thinking a little deeper, do so. Oh, the obligatory bit. Please, if you're watching on YouTube, will you subscribe, like the video. Um, if you're watching elsewhere on social media, if you could please like and share the video, if you like what you see and uh, encourage others to have a look and maybe open their minds as to what's possible when it comes to providing the greatest freedoms and the greatest protections for the greatest number of dogs. And you do that by having a mindset that says, perhaps, as opposed to a mindset that says, never.